with Justice for All. In this presentation, we will look at basic economic and business principles. We will see that if we understand and live by these principles, then everybody will be better off. We will see that economics is not a fight between winners and losers, but that it is about working together. We'll see how the worker, as well as the businessman, the poor man, as well as the rich man, will win. If we live by these principles, then the consumer is king. And we will have a system where there is truly justice for all. Research has shown that people in general have very little understanding of economics and how businesses operate. Workers believe that they receive low wages because businessmen are exploiting them. They think that most businesses make very high profits. And their sometimes unrealistic wage demands are based on this assumption. Consumers, on the other hand, are confronted by ever-rising prices, which they blame on the greed of profit-seeking enterprises. Businessmen are seen as profiteers, whose wealth is obtained at the expense of workers and consumers. At the same time, black workers see free enterprise and apartheid as one and the same oppressive system. They become easy targets for radicals and revolutionaries who would like to make the country ungovernable. As a result of these misconceptions, enormous damage is done to the economy, resentments escalate and political solutions become virtually impossible. In order to overcome these problems, the training division of the Free Market Foundation has developed the Justice for All video course. It consists of eight one-hour videos in Afrikaans, English, Sasutu, Zulu and Kosa. They explain in very simple terms exactly what the free enterprise system is and shows that we are in fact very far removed from such a system. The videos also show how a business operates, why profits are important, how a company stays in business and why consumers and workers benefit in a free enterprise society. The Justice for All courses can be presented to both literates and illiterates. Instructors' manuals provide a comprehensive guide for trainers and workbooks reinforce the video material. They also serve as a valuable method to reach a wider audience in the participants' home environment. Pre- and post-tests provide an objective measurement of attitudinal changes and comprehension, while the video commentary ensures a consistent message. The eight modules cover the following. Module 1 explains what the free enterprise system is. It shows that it's a just system, where a person can only act in his own self-interest when he acts in someone else's self-interest at the same time. Module 2 is about prices and profits. It explains the important role of the consumer in determining prices. It also shows how important profits are for creating wealth, jobs and prosperity in a healthy economy. Module 3 is about money and inflation. It explains what money is and how it developed. It also shows what inflation is, what causes it and how it can be prevented. Most importantly, this module explains that inflation is not caused by the free enterprise system. Module 4 deals with the concept of a company. It explains why companies are started, what shares, shareholders, directors and managers are, and how businesses are financed. It then introduces the very important concept of the company as a team. It shows that the owners, directors, managers and workers should work together, not oppose each other. In so doing, new jobs will be created, profits will be higher, and there will be justice for all. Every module is subdivided into two or three subsections. At the end of the module, there is a final summary of the whole module. Here, for example, is the final summary of module five, which explains what a company must do to stay in business. This brings us to the end of this module, and we can now make a summary of the most important points. We've seen that people go into business in order to make money. 
and not because they feel sorry for anyone. But a company can only stay in business if it has a product or a service which people want. And when it can produce this product or service at a cost which is lower than the selling price. We've seen that a company can have lots of costs, like factory costs, machinery and vehicle costs, interest, material, wages and salaries, electricity, fuel, telephone, advertising and so on. We've seen that a company cannot keep on borrowing money to pay its costs. And that it cannot always raise the prices of its products to do this either as the higher prices may scare the consumer away. There is in fact only one way in which a company can pay its costs, and that is by selling its products or services. We've seen that a company can only show a profit if it does something that consumers want. That is, it must benefit society. The profit of a company is not an amount that one can just add to the cost of an article or service, but it is the amount which is left over after a business has deducted its costs from the selling price. Therefore, if a company can lower its costs, then more will be left over and its profit will be higher. We've seen that not all companies make profits because not all companies produce a product or service that people want. Or they cannot produce it at a price which consumers are willing to pay. We've looked at what happens to the profits of those companies which do stay in business, and we've discovered the following. The profit of a company belongs to the owners or shareholders, and not to the managers or anybody else. This profit is like the seed of the person who plants mealies on an island. Just as in the case of this person, it'll not be in the self-interest of the owners to eat the seed of the company, that is, to pocket all the profit. It is this seed or profit which makes growth and prosperity possible. For example, the profit which makes this growth of a company possible will, at the same time, create new jobs. The new demand for labor will lead to higher wages, and workers will benefit. We've seen that, in general, less than half the profit of a company will end up in the pockets of the owners or shareholders. This part of the profit, which is eventually paid out to shareholders, is called a dividend. We've also seen that the free enterprise system is the workers' best guarantee of a fair deal. Under such a system, even those short-sighted and greedy owners who do not want to share the company's profit with the workers will have to change their ways. The profits of the successful companies will act as an invitation to new businesses. These new businesses will offer higher wages to workers. If the greedy owners do not want to lose their best workers, they will also have to offer better wages and working conditions. Workers, owners and management who want to better their own situation must understand what actions will achieve this end. Firstly, they must all work together like a team. They are not each other's enemies. Secondly, the object of working together is to keep the costs of the company down. Only then can the company show a profit and stay in business. Thirdly, workers must realize that unrealistic wage demands may succeed in the short term, but will always lead to unemployment at a later date.
Lastly, workers, owners and consumers should realize that the free enterprise system is their best insurance for a better future with justice for all. Module 6 is on wages, unemployment and trade unions. It explains very clearly how wages are determined, what causes unemployment and what the role of trade unions is. Module 7 deals with tools and productivity. At present, many trade unions are telling their members that new technology, hard work and higher productivity should be opposed as they result in unemployment. This module uses simple examples to dispel this myth. In this module, we're going to look at tools and productivity. We will see exactly what tools are, why they're important, and what role they play in production. We'll also look at productivity. We'll see what makes people more productive and how workers and consumers benefit from this. Lastly, we will see how workers can help a business to get the higher production, which can lead to better wages and an improved standard of living. Human beings of today look very much the same as 10,000 years ago. They may dress differently and have different customs, but they're not any stronger. And according to most scientists, not more intelligent either. Thousands of years ago, life was short, back-breaking and filled with danger. Today, there are countries where people still starve and where survival is a constant struggle against hunger and disease. On the other hand, there are places where ordinary working people live better than the kings of bygone years. They seldom go hungry and earn enough money to buy nice clothes, TV sets, cars and so on. Why do you think there are such big differences between then and now, and between rich and poor countries. Are the people in rich countries cleverer? Do they have better soil, more rain, or some other natural resource like gold, oil, or diamonds? The answer to all these questions is no. Some of the poorest countries have the richest resources in the world while some of the most successful countries, like Hong Kong, have no natural resources at all. Why are some places more successful than others? How come the average farmer in India hardly produces enough to feed himself, while his brother in America can produce enough food for a hundred others? The answer is simple, tools. We use better tools than 10,000 years ago. And developed countries use better tools than underdeveloped ones. As we all know, a human being does not have enough strength to lift a cow. But with the help of a certain type of tool, namely a crane, he can lift a truckload of cows. It took a caveman days to dig a hole in the side of a hill. Today, man can remove the whole hill in the same time. How? By using the right tools. But of course, tools do not just appear from nowhere. Somebody must make them. Let's see how and why it happens. We'll take as an example an island inhabited by 100 people. Each person works all day long and collects just enough food from the rocks to stay alive. If you were one of the islanders, would you be able to employ any of the others? No, how could you? What would you use to pay him for his labor? You're hardly able to feed yourself. People will call our island an underdeveloped country. Now, if one of the islanders, Harry Hardworker, works very long hours, he may be able to save a little of his food every day. In fact, by the end of the month, 
he may have saved enough to last him for an extra four days. During this time, he can live off the saved food and he'll be able to do something else. He may, for example, make a fishing rod during these four days. With the help of the rod, he can now catch enough fish for three people every day. He has increased his production. What made the higher production possible? The fishing rod, of course. It's the tool or machine which allows him to obtain more food than the others. Harry used his savings, the extra food, as a way to obtain better tools and machines, his fishing rod. The better tools, in the form of the rod, made higher production, namely the catching of fish, possible. Remember, he's now able to catch enough fish to feed three people. Therefore, he can employ another islander to do his fishing for him. He will pay this person a wage of one and a half days food for one day's work. He will, in fact, create a job for someone. Tools do not only result in higher production, but they also create employment. Why did Harry work so hard to obtain a fishing rod? Did he do it because he wanted to create employment on the island? No, of course not. He did it for himself. He acted in his own self-interest. But, as we've seen so often before, his actions resulted in benefits for other people also. This is a very simple little story, and many people may wonder why we try to make it sound so important. Well, this story holds the secret of civilization. It's by this same process that all human progress becomes possible. If, for example, you were now one of the other islanders, and you saw all this happening, what would you do? It all depends on the type of economic system. If they have a socialist system, the government or state will take people's savings to be shared with those in need. This may seem like a very noble thing to do, but it will lead to disaster. No individual will ever save enough food to enable him to make a fishing rod. He will see that it does not pay to save, and he'll go back to collecting just enough food to feed himself. The government's intention to help the poor will have the opposite effect. Everyone on the island will now remain poor. This is the situation in many of the poor countries. The reason they do not save may be because of the type of government they have. Or it may be because of their cultural or religious beliefs. Whatever the reason, the result is the same. They will remain poor. If the islanders have an economic system which is not completely socialist, but where the government still plays a big role in the economy, then one will find that only some people will get a license or permit to make or use fishing rods. These lucky few will do well, while everyone else on the island will remain poor. Many countries fall in this category. In these countries, poor people do not have the right contacts in the government, and it's very difficult for them to become wealthy. If, however, the islanders have a free enterprise system, then there will be no unnecessary restrictions. Remember, in such a system, the function of the government is that of a referee. Its main job is to see that people do not hurt or cheat each other. Its function is not to decide who may and who may not make fishing rods. If there's a free market system on the island, and you see how successful Harry Hardworker is, then you would probably also save some of your food. And get a fishing rod. You've now also used your savings to obtain tools. Many other islanders will do exactly the same thing. And before long, most islanders will have their own rods. Those with rods will catch more fish and will employ others. The tools have thus created employment. As you can clearly see, different economic systems will lead to different results. Under socialism, where the state tries to prevent people from acting in their own self-interest, saving becomes difficult and the production of tools is hampered. 
On the other hand, people sometimes believe that one can have a system which is a mixture of socialism and the free market. Under such a system, the state is not, like in socialism, the owner of all things. But there are many controls, rules and regulations. People will now still act in their self-interest. Some of them will get the protection of government. They will develop and use tools and their government friend will then prevent others from doing the same. As we've seen, it is only in a free enterprise system where the government does not hand out favours and where individual self-interest will lead to justice for all. Let's get back to our story. Two of the fishing rod owners may now get together to form the Blue Ocean Fishing Company. This company will use some of its profits, that is, some of the fish, as savings to pay for a small boat. It may take a whole year's profit to pay for the boat. Of course, the owners could use their profit for, say, having beach parties every night. But then they'll not be able to afford a boat. However, our two friends are thinking ahead. They know it'll be in their self-interest to save and invest in their future prosperity. By the end of the year, their company will be the owner of a boat. With the new boat, they can go to sea, where the fishing is better. Now each of them can catch enough fish daily for 20 people. The Blue Ocean Fishing Company, with their two rods plus their boat, can now feed 40 people per day. At this stage, the two owners may want to take things a little easier. They may want to employ four extra people, two to catch fish, one to clean them, and one to steer the boat. How can the company get people to work on their boat? Well, it's easy. Pay them higher wages. What made the higher wages possible? The higher production, of course. It's only because the company now catches enough fish to feed 40 people daily that it can afford the higher wages. And what made the higher production possible? The new and better tools and machinery, namely the boat. This is a very important conclusion. Higher wages for some workers were only made possible by introducing better tools and machinery which resulted in higher production. No government or trade union could force the company to pay higher wages until production had increased because of the boat. What will happen now? Well, it depends, as before, on the type of economic system they have. If the islanders do not have a free enterprise system, then other fishermen will probably find that they need special permission, licenses or permits to own or build a boat. The Blue Ocean Fishing Company will be very happy about this because they'll have the monopoly in the boat fishing business. They'll agree with all the restrictions on the other fishermen. They may say, for example, that boat fishing is a dangerous job and that therefore each boat fisherman needs a three-year apprenticeship before he's allowed out to sea. All their arguments may sound very good, but the result will be that there'll be fewer boats. This, as we can clearly see, will not be in the interest of workers or consumers. They'll not get higher wages or cheaper fish. If, however, the island has a free enterprise system, then the story will be completely different. Other fishermen, acting in their own self-interest, will soon try to get their own boats. In a free market, they will not be prevented from doing this. Production will increase, and they'll also be able to pay higher wages. If some of them do not want to pay higher wages, they may soon discover that the other boat owners will. Competition among boat owners will force each of them to pay the best possible wage. What causes the higher wages? The higher production, which was made possible by the better tools and machinery, the boats. Higher wages can only come from higher production. 
while higher production can only result from better tools and productive workers. If you now look at our island story, how would you answer the following question? Did the fishing rods and the boats create more jobs and better wages, or did they cause unemployment? What would you say? As we saw, the rods and the boats created more jobs and better wages. It is therefore not true that tools and machinery create unemployment. When many islanders have their own boats, one will probably find that some rock fishermen may lose their jobs. But at the same time, there'll be more and better paid jobs on the boats. The boat builder may need helpers. And because the islanders now earn higher wages, they'll be able to afford other things in life like shoes, clothes, and so on. But of course, someone must make these things. That is, there'll be more jobs. What we can say is that machines may destroy some jobs, but at the same time, they will create many new jobs in other areas. Well, do you think anybody will be able to persuade a person who saw a little story that better technology or harder work will lead to unemployment? Not likely. Module 8 deals with politics. It explains what politics is all about, what is meant by majority rule, and what a one-man, one-vote system is. Some situations are dealt with in an amusing way, which takes the sting out of an otherwise serious discussion. Such illustrations are definitely not forgotten. For example, the danger of unlimited majority rule is shown up as follows. In the same way, if the majority decides that everybody in a country should speak only one language, then no others will be allowed. In fact, in a true democracy, the majority can decide that the left ear of each of the minority should be cut off. And this will become the law of the country. It will be a majority decision. But of course, that does not make it right. A decision by the majority is not a guarantee that there will be justice for all. In the same way, the present black-white dilemma is shown as follows. We can compare the situation with a person who puts a baby lion in a cage. When the lion is still young, one can play with it, feed it, and care for it in many ways. But one day the lion will grow up. Then it can't be played with anymore, and it'll want to run around without restrictions. The growling lion will be rattling its cage as it tries to get out. Many people will probably say that it is unfair to lock up a lion. They may point to many other lions that are walking around freely. In fact, the person who put the lion in the cage in the first place may agree with them. The problem is to free the lion without being eaten in the process. Blacks and whites are in this same situation today. From our experience in presenting this module, we have found that the great majority of people find hope for our future in the message contained therein. One of the hundreds of positive comments we have from black participants reads as follows. We quote, South Africa has always been a country impossible to love, but with such courses, it will be the land of peace and stability. End of quote. The summary of this final and probably most important module is as follows. This brings us to the end of the module. Let's see what we've learnt. We've seen that politics is the study of how a country is ruled and how its rulers are chosen. Many people believe that democracy, that is a system where the majority of the citizens decide how a country should be ruled, is best. Democracy is also called a one-man, one-vote or majority rule system. An unlimited democracy works fairly well in countries where most people are of the same cultural group. However, in societies with different languages and different cultures, it normally leads to the oppression of one group by another. In South Africa, this shortcoming of democracy led to the system of separate development, or apartheid. 
Unfortunately, it did not solve the democratic problem, which is caused by the fact that democratic governments have unlimited power. Therefore, it looks as if one can solve the problem only by preventing individual groups from using this power for their own benefit. This can be done by spreading the power around so that no single group controls it or by limiting this power. One can spread the power by forming a federation. This is a system where a country is still ruled by a central government but where many individual regions within the country have their own governments. Russia, America and Switzerland are federations. In Russia, the central government has lots of control, while in Switzerland it has very little. A federation can only work for us if the central government has very limited control over the various regions. If it has lots of control, this will lead us back to the problem of oppression of one group by another. Another way of spreading government power is by means of a confederation. In such a system, different regions in a country act very much like independent states. They can join the government on a voluntary basis. In a confederation, the function of the central government is to make it possible for member states to work together on matters which are of importance to all. However, members cannot be forced to do things which they do not want to do. The democratic problem can also be solved by limiting the powers of the government through a constitution which protects individual or minority rights. This type of government is called a limited government. A limited government will always go hand in hand with a free enterprise system. A free enterprise system solves many political problems by placing them in the field of economics. People then stop blaming the government for their problems. Unfortunately, the only thing which keeps a limited government limited is a piece of paper called a constitution. This is a very flimsy guarantee against oppression by the majority who can change or scrap the constitution when they control the government. It seems, therefore, that the best system for South Africa is a combination of free enterprise within a federation or a confederation. In such a system, those regions which adopt a limited government and a free enterprise system will be more successful than others. Their success will bring other regions to copy the limited government free enterprise model. Our whole society will surely and steadily move towards an economic and political system which will ensure prosperity and justice for all.